welcome to Georgia Tech, um, our neighbors from down the street. Welcome to uh, Agnes Scott Women. Um, Agnes Scott is also using uh, Outcast United as their freshman or first year reading program and uh, are jointly sp sponsoring this lecture tonight. Um, as many of you know, this lecture is the culmination of our freshman reading project, which is a program that's um, sponsored jointly by the Office of Success Programs in the library. And the goals of the project, the freshman reading project, are to provide all freshmen an opportunity to participate in a common academic experience, um, an experience that we really hope will enhance your transition to Georgia Tech, to college, your intellectual growth, and ultimately your success here at Georgia Tech. In addition, another uh, goal of this program is to create a greater sense of community among our freshman class. Many of you are freshmen uh, sitting out here, sat in these seats just a few months ago at facet orientation, wondering what tech would be like, maybe a little bit scared, a little bit nervous, and now a few weeks into your first semester here at Georgia Tech, my hope, um, in addition to getting through your first round of chemistry and calculus exams, which you've all done, right, successfully, um, yeah, I see a, I hear a little buzzing on that one. Um, that you've met some new people here at Georgia Tech. You've made some new friendships, perhaps joined a student organization, and ultimately uh, begun to form a new community here at Georgia Tech. Um, when we talk about the concept of forming community and coming together with new people who have a diverse range of backgrounds, I really can't think of a better book that illustrates that concept than Outcast United which, as you know, um, tells the story of the Fuji soccer team and their coach, Luma Mufla, and happens literally right down the street from us, about 15 minutes away in Clarkston, Georgia. And it's not only the story, what I like about the book a lot, and one of the reasons that the library and I chose this book um, to launch the program last year, is it really, it not only tells the story of one woman's ability to make a difference, but it's also a story about building community among a diverse group of people. And as I said, this is the second year here at Georgia Tech we've used Outcast United as part um, of our freshman reading. And it's not just a great story, but also it, there are so many parallels that can be drawn between your own transitions and coming to college and coming to a new place that the book brings up. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, um, just a quick word on logistics. After the talk, there'll be, um, we'll go right into a Q&A, so think of some great questions that you might have about the book or for uh, Warren St. John. And then there'll be a signing, I'm in mean, a reception out in the, um, the first galleries that's sponsored by um, Campus Dining, GT Dining, and the Freshman Experience Program. So there'll be snacks and beverages, and if you brought your books, which I hope you did, um, Warren will be out there and you can uh, meet, meet him, chat with him, and get your books uh, signed by him. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Warren St. John, the author of Outcast United. Warren St. John grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and attended Columbia University in New York City. He's been a features writer for the New York Times and has written for the New York Observer, New York Observer, The New Yorker, and he especially wanted me to mention here at Georgia Tech that he's been a writer um, for Wired magazine. Um, his first book, Rammer Jammer, Yellow Hammer, A Road Trip into the Heart of Fan Mania, was published in 2004 and chronicles a season with fans of the Alabama Crimson Tide and was ranked by the Chronicle of Higher Education as, the number, as number one on its list of the best, best books ever written about college sports, and was also ranked by Sports Illustrated as one of its best books of 2004. Last year when we had freshmen read Outcast United, um, Tech was one of the first schools that chose that book for its freshman or common reading. And last I heard from the publisher of the book, Random House, I believe um, over 30 schools are now reading it, including many of our neighbor schools, as I mentioned, Agnes Scott, Georgia State's using it, Kennesaw and, and many more schools are picking it, which just I think attests to the powerful story um, and the great book that it is. And also, a lot of One Book programs, One Book San Diego, One Book Maryland, are, are using the book in their programs as well. Um, so one last word before I let Warren uh, take the stage is just for the next few minutes or for hour, just maybe put away the, the cell phones and the Blackberries and the iPhones and the iPads and uh, enjoy the next and, and enjoy this lecture. Thanks. Good evening. How's everyone doing? I heard that uh, Facebook was down. Um, I arranged that just before I took the stage. Try to get a few more of you out tonight. Um, I'm uh, excited to be here again and um, uh, particularly grateful 
for uh, the support and the interest that Georgia Tech has shown in this, in this book. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about a little bit about how I got introduced to the book, a little bit about some of the themes that I think are important in the book, and I'm going to talk about how I think you might be able to relate some of what I've written about in the book to your own experience as first-year students and maybe uh, get some lessons uh, from the experience of the people I've written about that might make your experience here at Georgia Tech maybe a little easier and uh, possibly a bit more fulfilling. I should say that when I wrote uh, this book originally, I was completely unaware of freshman reading programs and had no idea that my book might be selected for freshman reading programs. And if I had, um, I probably would have made it about 100 pages shorter. Um, so apologies for that. And in, in particular, I know that um, many of you are here uh, at Georgia Tech to study engineering and science and other things and have carefully structured your academic lives around avoiding reading 300-page books. Uh, so I understand I'm, I'm, I'm in the hole a little bit with you guys, and tonight hopefully I can, um, I can make, make something out of it to make it feel like it was worthwhile to, to have to read a book uh, in that uh, otherwise joyful time between graduating high school and going to college. Um, the other thing that makes talking to you tonight particularly gratifying to me is the fact that what I've written about is right here. It's right in your backyard. And I've talked to a lot of colleges, I've uh, spent a lot of time on the road this fall, and frequently I'm talking to people, I was just in Vermont, for example, uh, yesterday, I'm talking to people for whom this particular story seems quite far away, quite remote. But for all of you, what I've written about is, uh, oh, a 15 minute drive, uh, five hours if it's rush hour uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, but it's relatively close, and so one of the things I hope that you'll do is take advantage of this proximity to this incredible social experiment that's happening. I hope some of you will be inspired to get involved because this is a, this is a community that needs a lot of help and that really thrives and benefits from volunteers. And I saw that day in and day out in Clarkston. So I hope some of you will be moved to take advantage of that, and um, if nothing else, to head out to Clarkston and head out the Buford Highway and sample some of the extraordinary uh, ethnic and cultural cuisine that you have. You know, I live in New York where we think we're pretty spoiled, but having spent a, a year here in Atlanta more or less reporting, um, I can say that we don't have anything on Atlanta when it comes to, to ethnic food, so I hope you'll uh, venture far from campus once you've settled in. I actually learned about Clarkson and the Fugees on a trip down to Atlanta to talk about my first book, which in many ways couldn't be more different than Outcast United. It was a book about sports fandom. I lived in an RV for a football season with hardcore Alabama football fans to try to understand why people care about spectator sports. And that was a book that was inspired uh, by my seeing a couple on television uh, in Birmingham who was interviewed out in front of the stadium and they were in an RV and the reporter asked them what they had given up in, to follow their team and the gentleman looked somewhat guilty and said, well, we skipped our daughter's wedding to go to the Alabama-Tennessee game. And um, I actually tracked this gentleman down and asked him why he had done such a thing and he looked at me completely blankly and it was obvious from his expression that he had never once asked himself this very basic question, why am I doing this? So I took off for a, a season to try to ex understand that experience, and I wrote a book about it and was talking to educators here in Atlanta, and I got an invitation from a hardcore Florida Gators fan to join him and his wife for dinner afterwards and talk about the upcoming football season. So we sit down at dinner, and I just casually asked, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I, I work for the International Rescue Committee. And I said, well, wow, that's a refugee organization, right? He said, yeah, uh, I, I resettle refugees, lately mostly from Burundi. And very quickly I turned this polite dinner that was supposed to be about sports into a 45-minute interrogation of this poor, poor fellow. 
And I wanted to know things like, well, when you show up at work on Monday morning at 9 o'clock, what do you do to resettle a refugee? Where does that process begin? Refugees from where? How is their transition going? And how are the locals responding to having people from all over the world suddenly put in their small town? Having grown up in Birmingham uh, and in the South, I thought maybe that would be complicated. And of course, that turned out to be a, a bit of an understatement. But at the end of dinner, he casually mentioned that there was a soccer team comprised of refugee boys with a remarkable woman coach from Jordan, a volunteer, and he suggested maybe I should check them out. And in the introduction of the book, I talk about what happened that first game, the next day actually, when I went to see the Fugees play at a soccer complex north of Atlanta. And the gist of it was that uh, Coach Luma was a very quiet, presence on the field. She was quite intense. The coach of the home team was one of these screaming soccer dads, a bit of a nut, and I could tell he was sort of grating on Luma, and the Fugees were up three to one at the half, and I thought she'd be very happy about this, but she was quite unhappy, actually. And as she was giving her team a pep talk, we heard the, uh, the uh, Newt Rockney down there at the other end of the field giving, uh, doing his uh, pep talk to his players and Luma sort of froze and she narrowed her eyes and said to her players, you see that coach down there? I want you to keep scoring goals until he sits down and shuts up. The Fugees took the field and immediately they scored. And they scored again and they scored again. And at 8-2 to two, this gentleman sat down somewhat flaccidly on the bench and then the Fugees scored one more time. And the end of the final score was nine to two. And I was blown away, uh, number one, because here was a soccer team comprised of kids who had clearly very little. They were sharing cleats and shin guards. They uh, obviously, uh, they didn't have any fans. No parents had come out to see them play because their parents were too busy working night shifts and weekend shifts to have half a day to spend watching kids kick a ball around the field. And yet they had come together and beaten a team that had seemingly every advantage you could hope for. And furthermore, they, they were kids from some 15 different countries, many of whom didn't speak English fluently yet, some of whom had just arrived recently in this country, and yet somehow they had managed to coalesce and play this incredible half of soccer. And I was very intrigued about what was happening among the players on the team. I was interested in this amazing alchemy that seemed to exist between the coach and her players. And I actually went home and typed an email up to a friend of mine, uh, who's a professor, childhood uh, buddy, one of my closest friends, and told him what I'd seen. And he wrote me back about two minutes later and said, uh, if that's not your next book, you're an idiot. Well, that was before I really knew anything about Clarkston. And when I learned about Clarkston, that's when things for me got really interesting. Because Clarkston, this little town on one square mile, just out Ponce de Leon, uh, here in Atlanta, east of, just east of uh, the perimeter, was a little town where nothing interesting had happened for a hundred or so years. And in the late 80s and early 90s, it was designated as a resettlement center for refugees, first from Southeast Asia, then the Balkans, then various African conflicts. And in the span of, oh, five to seven years, this simple, homogenous southern town transformed into one of the most radically diverse communities in the United States. There are students from over 50 countries now at Clarkston High School. And when I heard about this and learned a bit about the difficulties that this transition had brought, not just for the townspeople, but also for the refugees, I, I was immediately intrigued because I thought, in some way, Clarkston was a, a sped up version of the sort of change that's happening all over America. We all know our communities are getting more diverse by the day, and we all deal regularly with the implications of that and the fallout of that, and we see it all around us in our political discourse. Uh, most recently, I think you might have heard about the controversy with the mosque in lower, lower Manhattan in New York, where I live, and all of these sort of slow and inexorable changes that are happening all around America happened in this little town overnight. And so it seemed to me that maybe by going to Clarkston and spending time there, it was like getting in a time capsule and traveling to America in 30 or 40 or 50 years. 
And perhaps from, by doing that, we could learn something about uh, what works, something about the difficulties that are coming our way, so that we can tackle this issue with a, a bit of mindfulness and a bit of intentionality rather than just being swept along in this change and having it happen to us. So um, there was another element, and that was Coach Luma herself. She was a, uh, a woman from Jordan originally, from a wealthy family, went to college in the United States. And at Smith, uh, when she went to school in Massachusetts, she got the sense that maybe the, the United States was a better place for her, a place where she could better pursue the life that she wanted than the life that she would go back to in Amman. And she told her parents that she planned to stay, and her parents took this as a, a major insult. After all they had done for her, all of the support they had given her, she was essentially, they, they believed, rejecting them and their, their life. And so they cut her off. And she drifted around for a little while after college, ended up here in Decatur, and um, was trying to figure out what to do with herself. She opened a cafe, she coached a girls soccer team at the local YMCA, and then one afternoon, on the way to a Middle Eastern grocery store in this little town called Clarkston that she didn't know much about, she uh, went too far on the road, went to turn around in a parking lot of an apartment complex and saw this group of young boys playing soccer. And they were playing the way she had seen the game played in her own life growing up. They were barefoot, they didn't have any fancy gear, playing on asphalt and having the time of their lives. And eventually on a subsequent trip, she got out of her car, introduced herself, asked if she could play, and that began her immersion in this world. And she identified a great need in this community, uh, many needs, and decided maybe she was the person to help. And the way she was gonna do this was by starting a soccer program. But if you've read the book, you know that what happened next was that it became much more than simply a soccer program. It became a conduit to, to helping these uh, families of people who just arrived here and uh, to uh, trying to inspire the young people to engage in uh, tutoring and other educational activities to, to help them make up this incredible gap that many of them had experienced because they'd been on the run and living in refugee camps. So. Uh, these are the three major elements of my book. There's the town of Clarkston, there's Coach Luma, and there are the refugees. And the, the thing that they all have in common is that all three of these entities and people uh, are going through extraordinary transitions. Uh, the town of Clarkston is transitioning from a simple old southern town where everybody knew everybody, everybody went to the same church, shopped at the same grocery store, to something else, this new international town. And the town was fighting over, well, what are we? Are we a refugee community? Are we an old southern town with partly a refugee population? What does this mean? And in this context, everything was up for grabs. The field in the, in the town park was a source of controversy, as I write about in the book, because people wanted to, uh, refugees wanted to play soccer there. Well, some of the old town residents wanted it reserved for baseball, uh, the American game, never mind that there was no one around to play baseball anymore. Uh, the community center was being fought over, the church, the grocery store, everyone in this town was battling over this incredible transition to this new thing that Clarkson had become. Coach Luma was transitioning from a life of comfort and one where things were fairly scripted to this great unknown that she had taken on by deciding to remain in the United States. She was someone who was trying to find her place, find meaning, find uh, a new family or social network for herself. She didn't quite know how that was gonna happen. And then most acutely, the refugees, of course, are transitioning from life in war-torn countries, life in refugee camps, to life in this little town where they'd been deposited a place they didn't ask to, to go, but a place where they'd been sent. And they were trying to make new lives for themselves, to learn English, to learn our customs, to learn how we do things, to learn how to make money in the United States to support their families. And so they were going through an extraordinary transition. And I would say that even within the refugee community, there was 
a group that had an even more intense transition to make, and that was the young people, uh, especially those uh, who were, say, age 10 or 12 through 16 or 17. And that's because they, would, they were placed in the public schools in DeKalb County. They would go to class, and here they, here they come with this, uh, sometimes they dress differently, they don't yet speak English, or they have thick accents. They don't eat what American kids eat in the cafeteria. They're frequently teased because of their differences. And so they do what kids who want to belong do. They try to adapt to the local norm. And they start pulling their jeans down a little bit lower on their hips like the other kids at school. They wear their hair like the other kids at school and start listening to hip hop and try to fit in and, and adapt to this new normative culture. Then they go home and mom and dad or mom or dad looks at them and says, what on earth are you doing? We don't wear our hair like that. Pull up your pants, you look ridiculous. What is that music you're listening to? We don't listen to that. You need to respect where you came from and who you are. And by the way, do you know what I went through to get you here? And as a re resettlement worker uh, said to me, it was a pretty powerful guilt trip because there was so much truth behind it. The parents had struggled so much to get their children here, and it was very painful for them to see their children change and become different from them so quickly and in such uh, profound ways. So the young people were ping-ponging between these two cultures and two worlds that wouldn't accept them for who they were, neither their peers at school nor their parents or families. And so they were sort of left to figure it out for themselves. Without any mentor to show them the path, they had to figure out, well, am I Liberian, or am I American, or am I a Liberian-American, and if so, in what proportion, and what does that mean? And there really wasn't any adult around to show them the path. And so this, when I was doing my reporting, was something I saw every day. It was uh, sometimes deeply painful to watch, and in this environment, something as simple as hairstyle could become a source of major conflict because uh, it had so much, it, there was so much baggage attached to how you wore your hair. It said so much about who you were, who you used to, used to be, who you were trying to become. And so something as simple as how you wore your hair could become a source of great conflict between parents and children and Coach Luma and her players. And, um, and this was the environment that these young people uh, were in. I think, um, when I speak to first-year students, I think it's this particular situation that is, is perhaps useful for you to think of as you're making this transition to college and to your new life here. Because in many ways, there's some similarities between your situation and Clarkston. And that is, many of you come from extremely different backgrounds, economically, geographically, culturally, and you're all put together in this new place and sort of left to figure it out from there. And it's terrifying, potentially. I remember vividly my first few weeks at Columbia. I grew up in, as you heard, in Birmingham, Alabama. And I got dropped off in Manhattan by my parents. I was 17 years old. And uh, my first few months of college uh, were absolutely miserable. I was homesick. I was completely lost. And I was in an environment with a bunch of people who all seem to know their way around New York and know the ropes and know all the cool places to go and how to use the subway. And I was this sort of, uh, uh, this sort of uh, fellow who'd fallen off the turnip truck and trying to feel my way around uh, the new, this new place. And I remember that feeling intensely. And I know uh, personally how hard it can be to make a transition when you've got to figure it out entirely on your own. Um, on the other hand, there's an extraordinary opportunity in this environment that you find yourself in. And that is because it is extremely rare in life that you get an opportunity to essentially create the kind of community that you want, yourself, you want for yourself from scratch. Right? Most of the time, you're simply moving into a as an individual into a community that's already got its own identity formed. 
it is what it is. And when you graduate from college and you move to Seattle or San Francisco or move back home, uh, you're going to be moving into places that are already what they are, and you're going to have to kind of make that work for yourself. But as a class of first-year students at Georgia Tech or Agnes Scott, you're in this unique position to create for yourself the kind of environment that you like to live in. And it's an opportunity that you're not going to get very often in life, if, if ever again. And I think one of the, the things to think about when you think about yourself in that situation is uh, to compare yourself a bit to the people that I wrote about in my book. I think um, I was talking to a professor the other day who talked about this idea that he, uh, talks, he, he talks to his first year students about uh, when, when he says you can float or you can paddle or you can row. And in my book, you get to see this on display. There are a lot of people in Clarkston who are just riding the current. And it's a very unnerving experience for them because they don't have much of a say in where they end up. And they feel like things are happening to them. And it makes them anxious. It makes them afraid. It makes them often feel alienated from their environment. And you see this most acutely in the town people. You see other people who are a little bit more intentional, a little bit, a little bit more engaged in trying to form some aspect or direct some aspect of their lives. And then you see people like Coach Luma, who are get, she gets up every day and tries to affect the world around her in a very uh, intentional way. She's working hard. She doesn't necessarily have all the answers. But she's, she's trying every day to make her community a better, more accepting place and to help the people in it. And I think one of the most exciting things for me as a reporter was finding this the character of this woman who didn't profess to have it all figured out. She didn't have a social work degree and a 10-point plan that she was going to implement. But she had a vision of justice and what she thought was fair. She had a vision of the type of community that she wanted to live in. And despite the fact that she had almost no social network in this town, she had very, very limited economic resources because she'd been cut off by her family, Despite all of this, despite having no leverage, she got up every day and worked to try to make the community the sort of place that she thought it should be. And that was a more welcoming place where everyone had a shot. And what's amazing for all of you is that you're in a situation now where you can really positively affect the community that you're in because it's not really formed yet. It's, it's happening right here. You've been in class. I heard today just a few weeks, four or five weeks, I believe, is that right? Um, and so it's really new. You're probably just getting to know many of your classmates. And, and I should say, I also remember that sort of awkward feeling of not knowing anyone the first few weeks of school. And what's so amazing as I look out in this room right now is knowing that there are people in this room who haven't yet met each other who are going to be lifelong friends. And I know that from experience. You're going to meet people who are right here, and they're going to be in your life for decades to come. And so you're in this incredibly active environment of foment. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? And how much responsibility are you going to take on for shaping it? Uh, I think the, the major hurdle, and it's one that people don't like to cop to, is fear. There's a scene early in the book where I talk about Coach Luma saying to her players, okay, let's divide up into groups. Uh, let's do a drill. She looks around on the soccer field and she sees that the kids from Burundi and Congo have grouped together over here, kids from uh, Bosnia and Kosovo over here, kids from Liberia over here. And she looks around and she has a revelation and realizes this is not going to work. This is not how you build a successful team. And she, in her own way, has to figure out how to dismantle this impulse among her players to group off with people who are just like them. And it's funny because when I started thinking about what I might say to first year students about my book, and, and I thought about my own experience as a freshman at Columbia, I have a vivid memory of walking into the cafeteria at Columbia, one of the first times I'd ever been there and 
looking around and seeing in these uh, communal tables we had, you had the jock sitting at a table over here, had the computer guy sitting at a table over here, uh, you had Indian students over here and African American students over here, you had preppy white kids from Alabama with REM t-shirts at a table over here and I was at that table. And we were all hiding in our little pocket of safety, our little place of familiarity. And that was because we were afraid and no one wanted to admit that that's really what was going on. But when you feel insecure about your place in a group, it's instinctive often to retreat to the thing that looks most familiar and most comfortable to you. And the case I would make to you here today is that if you do that, um, first of all, you're, you're definitely in the float category. You're letting things happen to you rather than taking an intentional path through college. But I think you're, gonna miss, you're missing out in a big way. And let me make the case for why I think that is. I think by engaging with people who are different from you, you're going to get three major things. And the first one um, is a bit mundane, but maybe it has more resonance for uh, tech students than for a lot of other communities. And that is, there's a practical uh, advantage to being able to relate to people who are different from you, especially in the business world. Most of you are going to, or many of you at least, will go work for large corporations that have uh, global uh, components to them and your colleagues are going to be people that you're talking with on Skype or video conference in uh, Asia and Europe and Africa and your comfort zone, your ability to relate to people who are very different from you is going to have a lot to do with how successful you are within these organizations. So there's a practical case to be made for just getting more comfortable engaging with people who, with whom you have very little in common. More acutely, and more to the point of where we are today, in an environment where you engage with people around you, no matter how different you think they might be, you get to know each other. And in an environment where people know each other, you're gonna feel safer. You're gonna feel more, less alone and more a part of something. And you're gonna feel at ease and calm in this environment. And that's gonna make accomplishing the things that you want to accomplish as a student a lot easier. There's a certain anxiety in your life that you can shut off. And I saw that in the Fugees in particular. I think the magic of the Fugees for many of the players was that there was no big normal that everyone was trying to be a part of, right? They instead were free to sort of be who they were because everyone was different. And everyone was okay with that. And everyone being okay with it was happy to engage and interact with everybody else. And because of that, they were able to focus on soccer and things that were more important to them than where they came from. And I think the, the real reason, the really exciting intellectual reason to get out of your comfort zone and meet people and engage people who are different from you is because of what you'll learn. And it's not just what you'll learn about them, although, there's no doubt that when you engage with people from different backgrounds and different places and different worlds who have different experiences, you, you will learn a lot from them. And I certainly learned a lot about the world just by my reporting in Clarkston. But you're gonna learn a lot about yourself and about your own life, and your own way of seeing things. And I'll give a simple example. I uh, would frequently fly back and forth from New York to Atlanta during my reporting. And I would stop at the rental car counter the Avis counter and dash off to soccer practice or a game or someone's apartment and interview the family. And I did this over and over again over the course of a year and a half. And uh, one afternoon, one of the, I was talking to one of the Fugees and he sort of casually mentioned, um, he said, you know, Mr. Warren, you must be a, a very wealthy man. And I said, well, gosh, why do you say that? And he said, well, you have so many cars. And I thought, well, okay, this is one of those moments where I'll explain to him a part, certain part of American culture. You know, we have, and I said, we have these companies that let you borrow a car. And then the conversation turned to, well, how do they know you're going to bring it back? Uh, you know, good question. And I said, well, they don't necessarily trust you to bring it back. Um, you have to give them this piece of plastic with a number and your name on it. And if there's a problem and you don't bring it back on time or you damage the car, um, 
and don't pay them for it, then they're going to write letters to these companies called TransUnion and Experian. And then when you try to get a college loan, uh, if it's within seven years, these companies are going to say you're a bad person and, uh, and you won't be able to get a loan or buy a house. And as I'm explaining this absurd process, I'm first of all thinking, well, no wonder they're having a hard time uh, adjusting to life in this country. It almost makes no sense, even when you explain it. But I would also was able to think for a moment about the implications of the way we live on my own life. Many of the refugee communities that arrive here come from places where what you see is what there is, and there's very little else. If you don't see it, it's not there. It's a very sort of literal experience, a literal way of living. Well, our society is organized uh, in a completely different way. We've taken huge chunks of our lives and seeded them to servers in control of people controlled by people we don't even know, our social lives, our financial lives, um, and our, our, our search engine searches that reveal deep secrets about ourselves and our anxieties. And all of that resides far out of our control and out of sight. And so this simple conversation about rental cars caused me to think, not only to think about the experience of the refugees, but to think about our lives and the way we live lives and to question things about my own experience. So, um, so, so the question is then, if you're going to build community, how do you do it? And in the book, um, I'm very careful not to get too prescriptive because I, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I think there are some easy lessons uh, that I want to leave you with before I take some questions. And, and um, the, the lessons of, of Clarkson, I think, are pretty clear. Number one, Top-down solutions don't work. You can't tell people they should get along. I can stand here all day at this lectern and say, get to know each other, get along. It doesn't really help you actually do that. If, if you're gonna take that step, the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, well, where can that happen? How can that happen? Where are the places in my life that I can actually engage with other people? And, and, if I, if, and, and where, how do I go about identifying them? Well, in the book, there are these little nodes of connection, these little magical places where people are able to come together in really powerful ways, ways that lead to lasting, dynamic, real relationships. Um, but where, they're, where they didn't go to do that, they went in service of some other goal. And the most obvious example of that is the Fujis themselves. The Fujis didn't get together as some sort of social experiment in making diversity work. They got together because they wanted to win soccer games. They really wanted to beat those kids from the suburbs when they went out on the pitch on Saturdays and Sundays. And with that common goal in, in mind, all of their other differences would fall to the wayside. It didn't matter uh, where your uh, last defender was from if a forward from the other team was charging and was about to shoot a goal. You needed to communicate with that person or you needed to get there and help your teammate, no matter where they were from, no matter what differences you might have. So the Fuji's is the most ob obvious example, but there are all these other examples. There's the example of the church, the uh, old Clarkson Baptist Church that turns into the International Bible Church of Clarkson. There's the example I give of the grocery store, Thrift Town, a, grocery store that was 10 days away from getting foreclosed upon by the bank when the, the sole refugee employee told the owner, Bill Mellinger, a good old boy from Tucker, Georgia, hey, if you carry some of my people's food, I'll tell people and maybe they'll shop in your store. And she was from Vietnam and his response was, well, I don't know what y'all eat. And she said, well, I'll show you. And they got in a van, they drove across town to the one other Asian market and he, she showed him what her people needed, what the staples were. And he went back to the store and went about trying to find this stuff to put it on his shelves, and he eventually did. And she told her, her friends, and they came, and in three days, that shelf was empty. And Bill Mellinger's no fool. He quickly hired more refugee employees, and now you can go to Thrift Town, and I encourage you to do it, and Bill Mellinger loves to give tours. Uh, you walk into this totally wacky international marketplace that's busy seven days a week and where over 30 employees are refugees. 
and where I actually had a difficult time fact-checking this section of the book, because every time I tried to call Bill Mellinger, he was at a different refugee wedding. He was a guy who'd made really deep connections with all of these different communities. Well, their, their self-interests came together in service of the social interests. He wanted his store to succeed. He had a capital uh, interest, uh, economic interest. She had a cultural need. Her people wanted their food. And over this shared interest, they were able to connect. So as you go about your campus life, it's worth thinking, how do I do this? Where are the places where I can connect with other people? I can tell you the simplest place is around sports. And it's even easier when your team is good. And uh, fortunately for Georgia Tech these days, that seems to be the case. If you've ever been in the student section for a last minute touchdown or a field goal to win, win a game, you find yourself embracing total strangers, you know what I mean, right? Sports is this sort of happy drug, potentially. It can work the other way, too, if you're not careful. Um, but it can make you connect with people simply around your shared allegiance to the same team. But there's so many other places in campus life to do it. There's uh, through religion, potentially through fraternities and sororities. Um, if you don't fall into the trap of joining a group that's just exactly like the people that you grew up knowing. Um, there's, uh, most, most uh, dear to my heart is volunteerism and working with people towards a common goal in the community to make things better. So I'd encourage you to, to go about your daily life here on campus thinking about those places where you have an opportunity to meet others in service of some other common goal. And I'd like to take some questions, but before I do, I just I want I want to end on uh, just one anecdote, and that is, um, and, a, and a bit of an exhort, exhortation. Um, there's a conversation I, I report at the end of the book with a young man named Shamsun Dekori, and Shamsun is from the Nuba Mountains, a village in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, and I asked Shamsun, uh, who's now a junior at Pfeiffer University in North Carolina, and He's doing great. He's got a thousand plus Facebook friends, and um, everyone likes Shamsun. Um, and he's settled in. He's doing quite well on campus. But when he arrived and he was 15 years old here, that wasn't the case at all. He was uh, terrified. And I asked him what he most remembered about those first few weeks in Atlanta. And he said to me, the first thing he remembered was how afraid he was of the escalators in the Atlanta airport. That was his first memory of life here, and he laughs about that now. But he said the thing that really st stuck with him was that he said that when he was a child, he knew that if a stranger showed up in his village in the Nuba Mountains, everyone in the village would come out to meet that person. And they would have lots of questions for that person. They would feed this guest and they wouldn't let them leave until they'd had an opportunity to understand everything they possibly could about the place where this person was from. And he said when he got to Atlanta as a 15-year-old, no one ever asked him where he was from. No one ever asked him about Sudan. No, no one ever asked him about the Nuba Mountains or even why he'd come here as a 15-year-old from a place so far away. And he said that that, that always puzzled him, and he said that mostly he felt that people were afraid of him, which gets back to what I was saying earlier about fear and a way we can retreat to the familiar and fail to engage with people we identify as different. So I would just encourage all of you, uh, as you embark on this incredible four-year, five, six-year journey of, of college, um, to try to be a little bit more like those people in Shamsun's village and a little less like those people he encountered when he first arrived, and to get out of your comfort zone and to see where it takes you. But in my experience, it's, an, it's going to be a, an incredibly enlightening experience for you every time you do. So on that note, I'd like to take some questions. I have, I'm having a little difficulty seeing out there, so you might have to, um, OK, that solves that, sort of. Um, but um, take a few questions. Is that, can we do that? Do we have time? Yeah. Anybody? Come on, your college kids. Got to be curious about something, right? Here we go. Oh, oh, no? Right? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So you, you mentioned that you had to do a lot of fact-checking for the book. Did you come in at the very end of the story, or were you there kind of alongside the Fujis? I was reporting, and I take it you all heard the question. He, he asked, was I there alongside the Fujis for, the court, for all my reporting, or did I sort of come after the fact? Um, I was there for about five months nonstop following the team, um, going to countless soccer games and practices and spending lots of time with the families and getting to know the townsfolk, and then I would come back and forth over the course of the next year. And I think one of the reasons I was so drawn to this story as a reporter and storyteller was because it, was, it wasn't a case of going someplace where something had happened in the past and trying to reconstruct it. Um, what was happening in Clarkston was happening in real time, and it's happening there today. There are refugees arriving every month in Clarkston from these days, mostly from uh, Burundi and Burma and Iraq. And every family that arrives faces all these issues anew. And so uh, I say that to you because what I wrote about and what I witnessed is happening right there now, and you can go see it and be a part of it and learn from it too. Um, if you decide to volunteer for one of the uh, resettlement agencies that I talk about in the book. And um, so I hope that answers your question, but it was all happening in real time. And the hard, the hard part of reporting that way is, you know, you don't really know what your story is when you show up, um, which is both exciting, but it's also a little bit terrifying because your editor is calling you saying, what do you, what do you got? How's it going? And two or two and a half months in, you're saying, I don't know yet. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just collecting notes. And at the end of the process, you have to take all of these interviews, all these transcripts, all the articles you've clipped, and everything you've learned, and then try to make sense of it. And that's, frankly, that's when panic sets in. Um, but you, you whittle your way through it over time. And uh, if you're lucky, when you're done, you've got a book. Down here. Question is, have I, have I been back? I've been back quite a few times. I stay in close touch with, especially with the, um, the Burundian family that I write about in the book, Alex, Bienvenu, and Ive. They've moved to Indiana, but I visited them there. They visited me in New York, Bienvenu has. Um, I stay in touch with Shamsoon, who I mentioned, and uh, some of the other players. Um, Clarkson has changed quite a bit in certain respects. The mayor who banned soccer is no longer the mayor, um, which I know will uh, make many of you nostalgic um, for, for the time when you had such a colorful character leading the town, but the guy who's doing it now is someone who's much more attuned to the needs of uh, the community, even those people in the community who can't yet vote, like the refugees. Um, I was visiting last year and city council election was coming up and I drove through town and I saw one of the candidates who I knew from my reporting to be fairly hostile to resettlement in general. And, uh, and I saw on her campaign signs that there were these flags from all around the world that formed the border of her campaign signs. And I was like, you know, wow, that's amazing. And what an incredible turnaround for this candidate. And I mentioned it to Coach Luma, and she said, well, have you, did you see the flags? And I said, well, no, you know, I was going 40 miles an hour. I didn't really, I couldn't really see them. And she said, well, when you drive by, have a look at the flags. So I kept that in mind. Next time I drove through town, uh, I looked at the flags on the sign, and it was like Canada, Switzerland, Great Britain. Um, but, you know, baby steps, right? Um, <laughs> um, but it was interesting that at least there was some, uh, you know, hat tip to the international quality of Clarkston, even if there's a little naivete about where everybody actually came from. I never met a Swiss person in Clarkston. Back here. Uh, what was the reaction of the Fujis when I first started reporting? Um, at first I was just like the weird guy with the notebooks and the tape recorder. Um, they called me the newspaper guy because um, uh, Luma told them that I work for a newspaper. Um, and in fact, you know, the first couple of months that I was in Clarkson, I really didn't, I didn't get much information. Uh, I was someone who, you know, refugees have been through an experience, many of them, or most of them, that doesn't make them uh, particularly inclined to trust anyone who looks like they might be 
with the authorities. And, you know, they've been betrayed by their governments. That's why they were refugees in the first place, probably betrayed by uh, rebel groups or military people of some kind. Often uh, refugee camp guards are very hostile, border guards are hostile. So here I am, a guy with a notebook and a lot of questions. And, um, and it's fair to say that they were not particularly uh, not particularly interested in talking to me about where they came from because they didn't know what my intentions were. And I think over a period of time, some trust developed. They got to understand better what my goal was. And then there was a shift. And the shift was along the lines of, um, okay, you say you want to hear my story and hear what I've been through to get here. Uh, sit down and start writing because I'm going to tell you. And I think there is... There, there's a real human urge, human need, in some way, to be understood by, your other, by other humans. And once they were over that initial um, skepticism of me and understood what it is that I was doing, they wanted to tell me their stories because they wanted people like you to understand what they've been through. Um, Shamsoon wanted all those people who just looked at him funny to have some sense of the path that he had been, been on to get to this country and what his experience was because he wants to be understood and he wants to be respected for his efforts and, um, and it's part of who he is. So I'd say over time things shifted more to that mode but it, it took time. You can't just parachute into a world like this, spend a few days and expect to, to get much. Yes, sir. Um, question was, what was the reaction in the town and among the Fujis to my book? Um, I don't want to speak for anybody. Um, I can just tell you how I experienced it, and that is, you know, I've, got, I've gotten a lot of email from people who said I got it right, and um, that's gratifying. I've gotten emails from people who said I didn't, or I was too uh, interested in the refugees' perspective and less interested in the locals' perspective, or... Um, maybe vice versa. I know that the, the mayor, Mayor Sweeney, when I originally wrote about him in the New York Times, I think he got about uh, 400 phone calls and emails from Times readers who, uh, many of whom let him know in no uncertain terms what they thought of his banning soccer in the town park. So he never really warmed to me after that. Um, but I was okay with it. Um, but an inter interesting thing about Mayor Sweeney, you know, when I first sat down with him to ask him about life in Clarkston and told him what I was up to, he said, uh, you know, I said, I'd like to write about the refugees in Clarkston and how that transition's going. And he listened very patiently and said, you know, um, I think a few years ago you might have had a story, but we've kind of taken care of all that stuff. Everybody gets along great. And, um, you know, just looking out for you, I don't want you to waste your time, so you should probably just head back to New York on the next plane tomorrow and um, look for another story. And when he said that, that was when I was certain that I had a good story on my hands. Because when a politician tells you everything's hunky-dory, and all you have to do is go to Google to see that a few months before, one of his own police officers was beating one of his citizens with a flashlight, and that it was recorded on a video camera, and then he was telling him, I'm tired of you Africans, you never listen, um, there was a disconnect. And he wasn't being candid, and when people aren't being candid, uh, that's because th there's a lot more iceberg under the water than iceberg above the water. And so that's why I moved down there, in part because of his accidental encouragement. Maybe one more? Right up here. Uh, what was your favorite part about following the Fugees? Uh, my favorite part about following the Fugees was just getting to know the kids um, and getting to know their families. There's an extraordinary generosity um, the hospitality is truly mind-boggling. You um, enter homes where people have literally next to nothing. Um, everything that they have has been donated by a church or by a refugee resettlement agency. And yet, because you are a guest, um, they bring out a huge platter of food. Uh, families that uh, can't afford to buy fish or meat will go to the farmer's market in Decatur and uh, 
get fresh fish and meat to make for you because you're a guest. And you, engage, you see this incredible hospitality from people who seem to have so little and who have such, uh, for the most part, such a resilience um, and frequently an optimism despite having been through things that most of us couldn't possibly imagine. And so, you know, I, I sort of joked with my wife that about a weekend in my reporting that I don't think I could ever complain with a good conscience again. And that's actually sort of held true. I frequently will catch myself frustrated about this thing or that thing, and then I sort of have to pull up and say, wait a second. You know, we are, we are the people in this room, all of us, we are really among the most fortunate people on the planet. And I have a really hard time when I turn on the evening news and I see all of this anger and rage at um, certain political rallies and that sort of thing. And I just think, how, how can we be so angry? Don't we know? You know, mo most of the world, people can't go where they want to go because they're afraid of being stopped at checkpoints. Um, they don't have clean drinking water. They can't get to other places where their family members are. They, they can't get food or any kind of job. Um, life is really, really hard. And yet, we've kind of got every advantage in the world. And, um, and so it definitely taught me to appreciate our, life, our lives and the way we live in a way that I will carry um, with me for the, the rest of my days. And I hope that on some level, um, you know, even though this is just a single book and um, you're reading it as you embark on a very heady and challenging intellectual experience, I hope that maybe a little bit of that seeped off the page um, and into your lives so that um, you really realize how lucky you are and feel, as I do, a little bit of a sense of responsibility to make the most out of this opportunity that we have all received just by virtue of um, having been born here. Um, so I think maybe that's a good place to end. I know I'm going to sign some books, and I um, hope to get to meet and chat with some of you before you go to your, um, your next thing. And I know Stephen's got a few words before uh, we go. Thank you so much. Before we let you go, Warren, on the, uh, on the topic of building community around sports, and especially um, around really good football teams, right? Um, on behalf of the student body and the Student Government Association, we want to invite you to uh, participate in our whiteout. Um, you may be back in New York this Saturday, but when we beat uh, NC State Saturday afternoon at noon, um, please join us as a member of the uh, honorary member of the Georgia Tech fan fandom here. Um, thanks again to um, I want to just uh, thank Agnes Scott for coming. Uh, thank our partners, Freshman Experience, um, as well as Do Campus Dining, GG Dining, who's sponsoring the reception. And as Warren mentioned, there'll be some food and snacks out in the lobby, in the, I mean in the gallery, and um, an opportunity to meet Warren and get your book signed. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight.